Okay, everybody got their clicker? All right, so uh, let me let me open class with any questions that you may have run into. Yes. Okay, I didn't bring my book for some reason. What was it? Just read it to me, and all. Slow down, one centimeter square per minute. <coughs> when the diameter is what? All right, so let me get this straight. We have a snowball, so we're assuming it's a sphere, solid, and it's melting so that its surface area is decreasing at one square centimeter per minute. We want to find the rate the diameter is decreasing when the diameter is 10 centimeters. All right, so you should try and draw two pictures. I said one of them is the moment in time, right? Is that the word I use, moment? And then the general picture. So at the specific moment in time that they're talking about, we have a snowball. And what I can tell you is that the diameter is fixed at 10 centimeters at that moment in time. So straight across here all the way. 10 centimeters. So I'm going to say capital D is 10 centimeters at the moment in time I'm talking. The general picture of this snowball, that diameter is changing because it's melting, right? So I cannot label the, the diameter as, fixed, as a fixed number, so I'm going to call it just capital D. Everything makes sense so far? Now, I said while you're drawing your pictures, you also want to write down what you're given and what you want. I'm given the rate at which the surface area is changing, right? The rate at which surface area is changing. So the rate means it's a derivative. It's the derivative of the what? The rate and change of the surface area, which I'll just say area as long as we understand we're talking about the surface area. So I'm given dA dt is one square centimeter per minute. Now it's decreasing, so we should use a negative because it's a decreasing quantity instead of an increasing quantity. So negative one centimeter squared per minute. I also should point out that throughout the problem, they use the same unit, centimeter, centimeter. If they're, sometimes problems are given, and they'll say centimeters, and then they'll give you something like, tell me what you know the, the rate and change in diameter when the diameter is one meter. So all of a sudden, they th throw meters in there instead of centimeters, so you have to convert. Make it all centimeters or all meters. But that's not going to happen here. Uh, what is it that we want? The rate at which the diameter is changing. So we want the rate being a derivative of the diameter, which I'm calling capital D, with respect to time. That's what I would like to know. I want to know that when exactly the moment that what? The diameter is 10 centimeters. We still good? OK. So at this point, I think I've labeled everything. 
Um, I'm going to try and see if now I can come up with a relationship between the area of a sphere and the diameter of a sphere. So somewhere in our formulas, we should have a formula for the area of a sphere. What is the area of a sphere? 4 pi r squared. We replace the r. So what we need is a d in here instead of an r. So I'm going to come over here to the side and say, well, the relationship I have is that my diameter is always twice my radius. That's a known fact. So I can replace r. Let me, let me divide both sides by 2 or put 1 half d. Half the diameter is the radius. So I'll be able to replace r with 1 half d, and I'll plug that in right here. So I'll have area is 4 pi times 1 half d squared. And it's important that the 1 half and the d are both being squared. So when you square the 1 half, you'll get the 1 fourth. You square the d, you get the d squared. So let me square it. And I should get to a final equation here. I think that 4 and the 1 fourth cancel out. So pi d squared, pi d squared. I'm out of space, so I'll have to go to a new page. Are there any questions, though, up to this point? No? All right, so here's where I am. I have area equals pi times the diameter squared. That's the equation that relates area and diameter together. So I want to find out what instantaneous rates of change are, so I need to take a derivative with respect to time. So I come in here, implicit differentiation. What is the derivative of the left side with respect to time? So what is the derivative of a with respect to t? dA dt. On the right side, pi is a constant, so I'm just going to bring it with me here, times now the derivative of d squared. 2d times, now the chain rule says go inside, take the derivative of d, dd, dt. Every time I do dd, dt, I always think of the old school wrestling move. It's called a ddt. I used to always do that to my little brother. I don't, I don't remember what the move was, but I'd always, ddt, and I'd get him, and I'd <laughs> practically break his neck, and then my mom would chase me around with the belt. DDT. All right. Any questions on the derivative? No? So let's just check things. DA, DT, do we know this in the problem? Yes, we actually do know what that is. Pi is a constant, 2 is a constant. Do we know the diameter at the moment in time? Yes, so I, I'm happy with that. D, 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 T, that's what we're trying to find, so I'm happy to see it. It's also in there. So I have everything I need. So it's plug in chug time. DA DT is negative 1 equals, uh, how about I just write, what's that? D is 10, right? That's a D, not a 0. D, so 10 times 2 is 20 times pi, so I have 20 pi over here. Then times D, 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 T. And finally, to solve for D, 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 T, we divide both sides by 20 pi. So I get negative 1 over 20 pi equals d, 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 t. And I'm going to put my units. That's why I left some space here. So to get units, just look at these two quantities. D is your diameter. What's diameter measured in? Centimeters. Time here is measured in. So t down here, minutes, centimeters per minute. So the diameter is shrinking, right? It's getting smaller because it's negative. So as the snowball melts, the diameter shrinks at the same time. So at that instant in time, that's the rate, the rate of change, instantaneous rate of change in diameter. Are we good or yes? Okay. okay. Any other questions?
Yeah, they say decreasing at this rate, right? So w when we put negative, we, we mean it's decreasing. So if you say decreasing at this rate, that you're implying it's negative. If you would have said increasing at this rate, then it would imply it's positive. So on a test, if you had that, I'd be, I'd be happy. Anything else? Okay. Six and three? Okay, what was six? Tell me what six was. When the diameter is 80 millimeters? Okay, so I want you to just look at what I wrote up there when you read that to me, okay? I've already translated it into the given and what I want, just by what they said. So let, can, the question is, can you do the same? All right, so read it again. Go slower, though. Okay, stop right there. The radius of the sphere is increasing means it's a rate of change. At what rate? For, go ahead. Okay. How fast, fast is the speed, right? Fast is the rate of change, is the volume, so that's why I wrote dv, dt. How fast is that changing, question mark. Uh, I think you may have wrote second down on accident there. It's just 80 millimeters, yeah. Okay, so I've written everything down here just translating purely from the words. Oh, four, not 40? Okay. All right, so what about the pictures here? It's a, uh, what is it? A sphere? Okay, so it's the same picture we had last time. The moment in time, my diameter is what, 80 <coughs> millimeters? But in my general picture, I can't use that. I have to use D. This is my general picture. So this looks like almost the exact same setup. The difference is going to be the formula you use. Because what, well, are there any questions on this so far? Sphere, here's fixed in time, diameter is 80 millimeters, and general diameter is D. Now, let's see if we can connect variables together here. I want D, R, D, T. I need to connect the, I need to connect the volume to the radius. Volume to the radius. So what is, the volume of a sphere. What do we got? Four thirds pi r cubed. So I'm I'm very fortunate that this formula already connects v and r together, doesn't it? So I can go and differentiate right away. Derivative of left side. Dv dt. Four-thirds pi is a constant, so it's just going to come along. Derivative of r cubed with respect to time. 3r squared times dr dt. I'll do a quick check to make sure that everything I have here is something that's either given in the problem or that I can figure out. So how about dv dt? Do we know this? No, but that's what I want, so I'm, I'm good with that. Four-thirds pi, three here. Oh, those threes cancel. Um, how about radius? Do you know the radius at the moment in time? Well, they gave you the diameter, right? But the radius is half of that. So that I, I know that that's going to be a 40, isn't it? 40. And then dr dt, do I know dr dt? Yes, four. So I'm going to be able to get the radius. I'm going to be able to get DRDT. Any questions? 
So DBDT on the left side, I'm leaving alone because that's what I'm solving for. I had 4 pi here. My radius we said was 40 squared, and then dr dt was 4. Are there, are there any questions on where the 40 came from? No? It's half the diameter. And then the 4 is the dr dt, which was given to us in the problem. So we just have to multiply that out. What is that? 40 squared times 16 pi. What's 16 squared? No. So what do we have here? Is that it? 25,600? Am I right? Pi? Someone check my math. Is that right? Yeah? Okay. Four times four times forty squared should be this. And then what's our unit? So volume is cubic units. Our units here were millimeters. So cubic millimeters per time in this problem was seconds. That was number six. And you couldn't check your answer on that one, right? <coughs> what chapter is this? Two? Two seven? We'll just check it with the solution manual here. Twenty five thousand six hundred pi millimeters cubed per second. All right, and three? What was three? Each side of a square is increasing. Okay, so let me write down six centimeters per second. Each side of a square, right? So we have a square. Ooh, I have a little square thing here. So I have a square. Each side of the square is is increasing. So it's kind of like if you've ever done this. Oh, not that. If you've ever done this with your mouse, not that either. Yeah, when you highlight. Uh, come on. It needs to be a square. It's growing like this, right? That's what's happening. You have a square. It's growing so that the sides are growing at a constant rate. Understand what's going on? Okay, so in each side is growing at 6 centimeters per second. Continue. At what rate is the area? Okay, so I'm going to want DA, DT, right? when the area is 16 centimeters squared. So I think from reading the problem, I know I want the instantaneous rate of change in area with respect to time at exactly the moment that it has an area of 16 uh, square centimeters. But what what is the rate that's given to me? Like, I know it's six centimeters per second, but where is that in my picture? It's the side, right? So I need to label the side of this thing. So why don't I call this any letter I want? How about X? I could call it S for side. doesn't matter. But remember, it's a square, isn't it? So every one of these is X, right? All sides are X. So then... I'm actually, given the rate at which x is changing, it's 6 centimeters per second. So if you're uh, keeping score here, this is what I'm given. This is what I want. 
right? I'm given this, I want this. This picture right here would be my moment picture or my general picture? Mo mo this one right here. That's my, that's my general, nothing's fixed, right? My moment picture would be I need to draw a square that has what properties? An area of 16, right? The area would have to be 16, which means that each side is what? Four and four, right? So this would be my general picture. This would be my moment picture. Now I'm doing, I, I wanted to do this problem kind of the way I did it here to kind of show you that you don't always just start off, I draw the picture, picture, then given what I'm given and what I want. It's, it can all come together as you're reading the problem or you start putting the pieces together. But what you want hopefully at the end is a general picture, is a moment picture, is what you're given, is what you want. You kind of want, if you can get all that, all that information down before you start doing derivatives. Any questions? Sure. All right, what variables do I have to connect together here? The area and the x. So how is the area of a square connected to the length of its side? x squared. Area is x squared, isn't it? If this is a picture of a square, the area of its x squared. So that's my equation. And that's what I'll differentiate. So what's the derivative of the left side? dA dt. Derivative of the right side? 2x times dx dt. There's your chain rule. So what about dA dt? Are we OK seeing that there? Yeah, that's what we want, right? Do you know x at the moment in time? Yes, we were able to kind of extrapolate that from, extrapolate? Extrapolate? That word doesn't seem right there. OK. From the fact that the area was 16 forced the sides to be 4, because it's a square. So we do know x, because we had to think through it a little bit. And then dx dt, that was given to us in the problem to be 6. So we have dA dt is 2 times x was 4 times dx dt, which was 6, which is 48. 48 what? 48 areas measured in squared units, and we were using centimeters here, so centimeters squared per unit of time. The time measurement here was seconds. That's it. Shall we check? Which one was this? Three? 48. Okay. Does that clarify everything? Okay. Do you see what part of it? Do you want to share what happened? No? Okay. All right. All right, I think that's every homework problem I gave you, isn't it? No, there was one more. I'll, I'll leave the other one. I'll leave the other one alone. All right. Let's get let's get back to business now. So to be uh, official, our test, I'm going to write this down, is, is officially a week from this Thursday. So exam two, right? Exam two is Thursday. March 26th, it's an, on our schedule, it's supposed to be this upcoming Thursday, like in two days. So we pushed it back because I didn't, didn't want to come back and say, hey, here's more related rate problems and now let's have a test. This gives you a little more time to get the related rate problems down. Um, but that means on Thursday, I'm going to cover some new stuff. So the test will include stuff I do on Thursday. So that's the give and the take on that, all right? A little more time a little more material. Um, we'll, I'll try and have a review, something that you can start to look over by Thursday, this Thursday. 
for you to mess with on the weekend? Yeah, because I have office hours now after class, so I'll hang out, yeah. It'll be from Chapter 3. It's just some new derivatives. Like up to this point, we can take derivatives of a lot of things, but we haven't talked about like what's the derivative of e to the x, or what's the derivative of the natural log function. So we're going to look at exponential functions and logarithmic functions and just talk about what their derivatives are. So it'll be like product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, but just now with some new functions. Like when I said, what's the derivative of sine? We said cosine. Well, we're going to have some new ones. That's all. So, so it won't be like, like this sort of concept where it's completely different and you have to spend hours and hours and hours and hours on it. All right, so we left off with 2.711 is where we finished last class. And now we're going to get into some different problems where our geometry is going to change, the, problem, uh, the, the setup is going to be a little different. So we have this plane that's flying overhead, and we're going to be looking at a distance here. So a plane is flying horizontally, altitude of two miles, so it's two miles high. It's traveling at 600 miles per hour. The plane is headed directly over the gro a ground-based radar station. So here's my plane, the red dot. Here's the ground-based radar station. At the moment the plane is six miles from the radar station, so the moment that it's six miles from the radar station, how fast is the distance between them changing? So I showed you this animation last time. There's the plane flying over. Notice that in the picture, I've kind of constructed a right triangle, right, to get you to think that way. And the, the thing you should notice is that in that right triangle, the two is always the same, right? That's the altitude of the plane, two miles high. The thing that we're interested in is the red line, is the, the hypotenuse of that triangle. It's, it's the distance from the radar station to the plane, right? That's what we're interested in. So a lot of students make the mistake of thinking that when they say, um, at the moment the plane is six miles from the radar station, a lot of students make the mistake of thinking they mean from the shadow of the plane straight down on the ground from there to there being six. That's not what they're referring to. It's from the radar station to the plane. Okay, plane is six miles from the station. That's if you measure it, straight line. This part of it is six. At that instant that it's six, how fast is that red line shrinking or growing? Right? Understand? So we're looking, here's the actual instant in time that that's six. So would you agree that if it's, if it's uh, at this point, the red line's shrinking, right? And then it starts getting bigger, right? So you would say right about there, that red line was decreasing, but on the other side, it could also be six miles away and it would be increasing, wouldn't it? So what we're more interested in is not which side it's on. It's just what's that rate of change. Whether or not you want to look at it increasing or decreasing doesn't matter. It's changing, right? So it's almost like an absolute value. We're looking at just the magnitude of the change. All right, so let's try and draw some pictures. I have my, my moment picture. I'm just going to put M because I'm getting lazy in my G picture for general. So at the moment in time, I have the ground, I have my radar station, I've been working on my art skills over the break, so here's my little radar station, there, that's a radar, and then I have a plane, I'm going to choose to put the plane on this side, anyone know what kind of plane that is? Concord. Yeah, it kind of does look like. Except it would be on fire and, and crashing. That's not right. All right, so there's my plane flying over. Um, at, at the moment in time, what I know 
for sure is that this is two. That's going to be the same no matter what. And I know at that my moment in time that this is going to be what? The hypotenuse will be six. And that this is a right triangle. That I know for sure is the moment in time. Now, in my general picture, I'm going to kind of reconstruct the same thing. And this time, I'm going to go not so artsy. I, I think sometimes I intimidate my students with how good my artwork is. So you can use points if the art that I'm using up here makes you feel inferior. All right? I'm kidding. Y'all, I hope you all know I'm kidding. What's that? You mean like how bad my drawing is? No. Okay, we are we are constructing the right triangle based on the fact that the plane has a constant altitude of 2 miles and it's flying horizontally. That's what it says in the problem, right? So and we are assuming the ground is flat. Okay, so yeah, good question. Now, of course, if you want to do this properly, you have to take the curvature of the earth into play. And and we are we are ignoring that at this point. That would become a more advanced problem later. Yeah. So we are assuming the ground to be horizontal and flat and the path of the plane to be flat also, right? Again, this goes back to something I said about like when you start with physics problems, you, the first thing you ever do is act like there's no friction. And you do all the physics on no friction and then you throw friction in later. Here we do like basic setups. You know, it's good enough to get us a basic answer. Now you want to put the curvature in. Now you're going to now you really want to shoot a plane down, right? You want to and that's what the military does, right? So they need people that they need people to actually think about the curvature of the earth when they're doing this stuff. Baby steps. All right, so in my general picture, I can still fix this to be 2, right? That's not going to change. But this now can no longer be fixed at 6. I need to just give it some quantity. How about H for hypotenuse? You want to do that? Uh, I'm open to, to most letters. I'm, I'm pretty happy with using anything. I like to reserve things like this side. I would call that X because it's like the x-axis, like up and down to be like the Y hypotenuse. That's just my preference. I would stay away from D unless it's a diameter, only because you get the DD, DT is kind of weird to me. It's always been kind of weird to write like DD, DT just, just looks odd to me. I'm not sure why. All right. Do you agree with that general setup? How about what we're given and what we want? We're given, we're given something and we want something. Can anyone give me one of those? Are we are we given the out well the altitude's always two, right? So we are given that. It's gonna stay fixed. But I'm talking when I say given and want, every time we've done given and want, it's always been two derivatives, right? One of them has been d something, d something, the other one's been d something, d something. So in terms of derivatives, can you tell me something about what we're given and what we want? Of what? Of the hypotenuse. Are you saying that's what we're given or what we want? We want the rate of change in the hypotenuse, which is the hypotenuse represents the distance between the plane and the radar. So we want that, right? D, how do I write it? H, D, T. When do we want that? When what six? When the, exactly the hypotenuse is six. Does everyone agree with that? You want to know the rate at which that hypotenuse is changing at exactly the moment that it's 6. What are you given, though, as far as the rate of change? You're given the speed of the plane, right? Speed is a derivative. It's a rate of change. So it's the speed at which that plane is moving horizontally, yes? I need to assign a letter quantity to that, right? A letter, value, like to somehow write d whatever over dt. 
I don't, I'm missing a variable is what I'm trying to get at. I'm missing something in here. What's that? S for speed, you could use that. In my geometry, in my picture though, what's changing? The plane, right, is moving. So l let me help you. X, okay, X is fine, but where's X on my picture? So would you agree that if this was a line that went this way, and I were to draw my triangle this way instead, right, if I would have done that, then from this point in the top corner of this triangle to this point, which is the plane, that, that the distance there is changing, yes? That's moving. And the point that's moving to the right, the plane, is moving at six, what is it, 600, 400? 600 miles per hour. But this change from this point to this point is equivalent to the change from this point to the bottom of the hypotenuse or the bottom of this uh, vertical line, isn't it? So what if I label over here on this side of this triangle this side to be X? Then as the plane moves, this red line is moving away, isn't it? Which means that that X is getting bigger, and it's getting bigger at exactly a rate of, I forgot already, 600 miles per hour. So DX DT is 600. Miles per hour. Any questions? See, that took a little massaging to pull that X out of there to make that happen. S would have been fine also, yes. The only thing that I would be a little bit hesitant on the S with is this. If if you want to use S because S is the speed of something, then DS DT is the derivative of the speed, right? That's what that would mean, which would be the derivative of a derivative, which would be acceleration. So it, it just that's why I wouldn't have used it. X here is just the length of that side. So it's changing at a certain rate, and the rate is 600. Wouldn't be wrong. It's just that's why I wouldn't use it. Okay, I need to connect what two variables together here? X and H. So I go to my general picture, and I ask you, how can you connect this side and this side together? A squared plus B squared is C squared, the Pythagorean identity. X squared plus 4 is H squared. So I'm using the Pythagorean identity to be able to write X squared plus 4 equals h squared. And as long as this equation has an h in it and an x in it, you're ready to roll. Differentiation time. Derivative of x squared. 2x dx dt. Chain rule. Plus, what's the derivative of 4? zero equals derivative of h squared to h times dh dt. Chain rule again, right? Because it was attached to the rest of it with multiplication, right? This is being added. So you do derivative of these separately. Derivative of a constant by itself, by itself, is zero. All right, let me clean this up a little bit. Um, this isn't really even here. I noticed that these both have twos in them, right? So could I divide both sides by two? So I get something like x dx dt equals h dh dt, 
and I haven't run my little check yet to see that I have everything I need to go ahead and get the answer. So let's go through each of these and see if we have them. Do you know what X is? At the moment in time, do you know what X is? Well, we never got X here, did we? Because we didn't know we needed it when we drew the original picture, did we? But can you get it? Yes, because at the moment in time, you know two sides of a right triangle, you can always solve for the third. So we will be able to get that X. So I'm going to be able to get that. DX, DT, do we know what this is? Yes, that's 600, so I'm happy with that. Do you know what H is at the moment in time? Yes, that was 6. Do you know DH, DT? No, but that's what I want, right? So everything is accounted for. So I've got a little bit of work to do here. I've got to go figure out what X is. Then I'll come back and plug everything in. So let's go get X. And I'll do that right here, a little scratch work. I had this right triangle. I had this was 6 and this was 2. This was X. I just set up a quick little Pythagorean. X squared plus 4 equals 36. So X squared is what? 32. So X would be root 32. And I don't need to look at the negative because X is the length of that side of a triangle. It's not going to be a negative. So it's an, the square root. And I'm just going to leave it. I'm not getting a decimal or anything. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. Any questions on that? This was a little scratch work over here. There's a bunch of scratch work here, isn't there? All over the place. Okay, so let's work through this. Um, rewrite this equation here. So we've got x we just found was root 32 times dx dt, which was 600, equals h, which was 6, times dh dt. Divide through by 6 on both sides so that you can isolate the dh dt. And this just becomes 100 times root 32 is dh dt. And what is that measured in? h is measured in miles, right? That's a measurement. h is a distance. Time is in hours. So this would be mph. I'm going to see what that is as a decimal. So this is approximately 565.69, something like that, miles per hour. How fast was the train, uh, train, the plane traveling? 600 miles per hour? So what we're saying is this. If, if you were attached, if you were standing on the ground with a rope in your hand, attached to a plane flying over at 600 miles an hour, right? At the moment that the plane was six miles from you, the rope, at that instant, the rope would be coming out of your hand at 565.69 miles per hour. That freaking burn when that happened, right? I always had, as a kid, this, like, this thing like that I would think about that would hurt. I don't know why I'm even telling you this. But I always thought about taking like a big needle with that real thick yarn on it. And like if you put that through your skin, like just pulled real fast, like just, I don't know why. Just when I was a kid, I always thought about like that was the worst pain I could think of is if someone did that to you. It's pretty bad, huh? Or you could hold on to a rope and have it come out of your hand at 565.69 miles per hour. I have a question for you. Could this, let's say your answer here was 750. What would you be thinking? Something's wrong. 
Why? Does it make sense that there's no way that that rope could come out of your hand any faster than the plane itself was traveling? Right? I mean, if you were if you were standing instead of down here, if you were up here, let me get let me let the plane get past me first. Okay, so if I'm here and I'm holding a rope connected to the plane, how fast is it coming out of my hand? 600 miles per hour, right? Cuz I'm parallel, I'm up with it at 2 at 2 miles high. There's no way it could come out any faster than that. So your answer should be less than 600, no matter what. All right, let's just take a vote on how you felt about that problem, whether or not you were okay with it. All right, that only took us like maybe, what, 30 minutes? We did a couple of problems first, right? So 20 minutes, 25? I, well, I didn't keep track of time when we started. All right, let's look at another problem. It's the same exact situation. Voting's closed. Plane's horizontal, two miles high, 600 miles per hour. It's going directly over a radar station again. At the moment, the plane is six miles from you. Same exact situation. How fast is the angle of the tracking radar changing? See, so what they want now is instead of saying how fast is the distance between the radar station and the plane changing, it's how fast is the angle changing? Totally different quantity that they want. So there's your measurement of your angle. So there's the angle. We want it at a specific instant in time, actually right there at that instant, how fast was that angle rotating? Two pictures, moment, general. At the moment in time, I'm again going to put the uh, plane past me. Can I still put a two straight down? still two miles high, right? Can I still draw this? Yeah. And I can label an angle. And the, the angle I'm going to put here is right there. I'm call it theta. See, so I'm not interested in that hypotenuse anymore. Do you see that? That's not the key for me is not that hypotenuse. I'm interested in the angle instead. Um, can I say, though, that the hypotenuse is 6? Yes, because that's the moment in time, right? Why is that useful? It, yeah, I mean, that angle, at that moment in time, that angle is fixed, isn't it? How are you ever going to figure out what that angle is? Well, you have two sides of the triangle, right? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of, you're telling me something like sine of theta is 2 over 6. I think in pre-cal, maybe, you were asked to find the angle. If you, if you were given sine of an angle was 2 sixths, you were asked to go find the angle after that. So we'll, we'll probably have to do that in a minute. But I'm just pointing out why it's important to have that information. All right, what about our general picture? Da, da, da. Plane, radar, got the hypotenuse. This is still 2. It's fixed. This time my theta is here, but it's changing, isn't it? That, that blue line is no longer fixed. So as the blue line changes, the, the angle changes. Any volunteers for what I'm given and what I want? Please don't speak over each other. Raise your hand. Anyone? Bueller? What do we want? 
d theta dt. We want to know how fast that angle is changing, right? d theta dt. When do we want that? At what 6? h is 6. So when h is 6. Now, we didn't label h, did we? In our general picture, we didn't label h. So I better label it now because I'm using h down here, right? I'm using h here as 6. So I better label h on my picture here so everyone knows what I'm talking about. So I want to know how fast that, that angle is changing when exactly when that h is 6. What are you given? The speed of the plane, right? Well, how did we deal with that in the last problem? dx dt, but then we had to label our triangle with an x, didn't we? Same thing. We're going to have to label it with an x then. Label it with an x. Call this x, and then we're given dx dt. And we're given that to be 600. miles per hour. Do you think that's enough for the equation now? Can we try and come up with an equation? What variables am I going to try and relate together? X and theta. And I'm going to go look at my general picture over here. How can you relate X and theta together? X is the adjacent side, isn't it? Okay, so I could use I could use cosine. Don't don't write this down. I could write cosine theta is what? X over H. Yes? That is correct. You could do that. However, think about this for a second. If I were to take a derivative now, I would get I should get a d theta dt because theta is in there, right? I should get a dx dt because x is in there, but I'm also going to get a what? dh dt. And I don't have any information about dh dt over here, do I? So although this could be used, it's probably not as efficient as using maybe a different trig function. Tangent. So let's try tangent. If I do tangent theta, that's opposite over adjacent, 2 over x. And now the only two variables that appear are theta and x. And that means when I do derivatives, I'm going to get d theta dt, and I'm going to get dx dt, which is good because those are the two things that appear. With me? Okay. Derivative time. You want to take this derivative? I need a vote here, okay? So listen to my question. Hold on. Listen to my question. You're sitting there. For a lot of you, this is the first time you're seeing related rates, all right? I just need, like, a general idea of whether or not you feel okay with this or not. I mean, it's one thing, I guess, to sit here and watch me do it, and I'm guiding you through this. But is this, like, making you really kind of nervous? Are you, like... A little bit afraid that this is going to be a bad thing on the test, or are you starting to catch on to it? So I just want kind of a thumbs up, one, thumbs down, two, you know, to give me an idea of, well, no, we don't, you have all the numbers. Let's do from scale from one to ten. Ten being like you feel real good, and how do you do a ten on there? Uh, do one to nine. I think you do the zero, right? Let's just do one to nine. Nine being, let's go. One being, Where's the drop slip, you know? So, ready? Go ahead. Tell me how you feel. Did I stop it? Oh, oops. Okay, start again. Go ahead. I'm not going to show you the results until everyone votes. I bet you going to be a bunch of fives. Thanks a lot. Everyone done? Let's see what happened. Seven. That's good. All right. You know, it, it, this is one of those things, even like when I was in Calculus 1, I mean, it, it didn't, 
it, it took doing so many of these problems that you just get to a point where you're comfortable. But it requires a lot of problems because I mean, this, I think you could do now a plane flying overhead. But they, these problems can come in any form. It doesn't have to be a plane flying overhead. It could be like the next one we're going to do or something else, something completely random. So it's about taking a situation, real world, translating it into the math, and then doing the math, right? But isn't that what engineers do? I mean, isn't problem solving part of what engineers and electric, electrical engineers and computer scientists do? Take a real world problem and use their tools to try and figure it out? So even though you may not like this, this is probably the most applicable thing that we do in this class, problem solving. All right, I'm, I'm stalling because I'm, I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do about this derivative. I'm thinking about what you're going to do to that. You want to just go for it right here? Do it. Derivative of tangent theta. Secant squared theta. Times d theta dt. Where did that come from? Well, after you're done taking tangent of my mouse, my cursor, Derivative of tangent of my cursor is secant squared of the cursor, but then you have to go take derivative of the cursor. The cursor is theta. Derivative of theta is d theta dt. So you have chain rule there also. Equals. Dun, dun, dun. You could do quotient rule, or you could bring the x up as a 2x to the negative 1. That's the way I would have done it. So looking at this as a 2x to the negative 1, and then taking the derivative. What is the derivative of 2x to the negative 1? Negative 2 comes down, so or negative 1 comes down, hits the 2. Negative 2, x to what power? Negative 2, chain rule, times dx dt. That, that is the derivative of the right side. which is really just secant squared theta times d theta dt equals negative 2 over x squared times dx dt. Questions? So what if someone on a test did the derivative of this was 0 over dx dt? What did they do? They just did derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom, which is completely wrong because that's you're not allowed to do that, right? All right, let's check this thing to see if we have the information we need. And now everything can be fixed at the moment in time. Do you know what theta is at the moment in time? Not yet, right? But we said earlier at the moment in time we would be able to recover theta. Do you know d theta dt? That's what we want, right? Do we know x at the moment in time? Well, x was down here, wasn't it? We did that in the last problem, didn't we? We had to find it was root 32. So we know we can get it if we need to. And do you know dx dt? Speed of the plane. So everything there is doable. We just have to do it now. All right. So I'd like to write something else down here.
so all I'm doing is I'm just reminding you that secant squared theta really means secant theta, then square that answer. And, I, and since I'm going to need this picture, I'm going to bring it down here. 6, 2, we knew we could solve this root 32, didn't we? And we knew that we could get our theta from here. I don't think we actually need to find theta because what is secant of theta by definition? Secant is the reciprocal of what function? Cosine? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, isn't it? So isn't this secant theta just 6 over root 32? Yes. So if I do 6 over root 32, that's secant theta and then square that. See, I didn't even need to go recover the exact value of theta to do, do that. I got lucky. D theta dt? I don't know. Negative 2 over x was root 32, but then square it. 32. And then dx dt was 600. We're almost there. 36 over 32. So I, I'm squaring the top and bottom here. D theta dt equals, oh my goodness, um, does that simplify? It's negative 1,200 over 32 over there. Oh. I'm going to get d theta dt by itself, so I'm going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 36 over 32, which is 32 over 36. And I'm going to do that here and here. 32s cancel. It's all gone. So we have d theta dt equals... 12, negative 1,200 over 36. That reduces. What, 12 goes into each of those? So what is it? Like negative 100 over 3? Y'all there? Now, units theta over time what's time let's start with that one because that's easier hours or hour per hour theta radians or degrees you know right it never said anything about whether or not we were in radians or degrees in the original problem did it it's always radians all right radians Theta will always be measured in radians unless you are asked to convert to degrees. So this rate of change is in radians per hour. Radians. You just put rad per hour. Do you all hear me on that? It's always radians, never degrees, unless they tell you to convert. You could convert this to degrees per hour, but that's the measure. It's negative. Why is it negative? Because of the way I drew it, right? The plane was on the other side. So look what's happening to the theta. Our theta right here is this one, right? This. As that plane moves away, that theta is getting smaller, isn't it? Okay. So it's shrinking at a certain rate, and that rate is negative 100, or you could you could do it as a decimal, negative 33.3 radians per hour. Whew. All right. Spring break hangover here. You can see it.
Ready for the next one? I'm trying to show you as many as examples as I can. That's my, my goal here. So that when you're faced with these, you've, see, you've had enough exposure to them. A street light is mounted on the top of a 20-foot pole. A six-foot man walks away from the pole at a speed of seven feet per second. How fast is his shadow moving along the ground relative to the pole when he is 12 feet from the pole? I'm not going to show you a picture. Let's see if we can just do it. We'll come back to the picture later. Let's start uh, start drawing stuff here. Moment, general picture. Street light, 20 foot pole. Okay, so I've got the ground. I've got a street light. Check it out. Yellow light up there. And then it's 20 feet. That's not going to change in the problem, is it? Okay. Um, a six foot man walks away from the pole at a certain speed. So I'm just going to let this man be walking along this way, away from the pole. Um, he's six foot tall. How fast is his shadow moving along the ground relative to the pole when he is 12 feet from the pole? So let me put my man here. And at the moment in time, he is 12 feet from the pole, right? I'm interested in his shadow, though. So his shadow, because this light is radiating out in all directions, right? His shadow should be where the light hits him, it's blocked, should be coming down, hitting the ground, something like, like this. Here's his shadow on the ground. See his shadow? Again, please go take an art class or something, okay? As he moves, that shadow changes, doesn't it? Right. Maybe it's time for a general picture. This is still 20. The man is still six feet tall. Oh, I never, I never put his six foot. Sorry, six foot there. Those two things aren't going to change, right? This man's height and the pole's height. What is changing, though, is the distance between the man and the pole, right? So let's label that. What do you want to label it? X. Okay. His shadow, the tip of the shadow, is this point on the ground, isn't it? That's the tip of his shadow. It corresponds to that point over there. It says, how fast is his shadow moving along the ground? I didn't put tip of his shadow. It's implied there that we mean the tip of his shadow. How fast is that moving relative to the pole? Relative to the pole means the distance from here to here, the whole thing. I better label that because I want to know how fast that's growing, right? So what do you want to call that one? S for shadow? Is that okay?
I, I'm looking for guidance here. I mean, of course, I can tell you what the next step is and what to draw next, but I'm, I'm hoping you can help guide me through this a little more now that I've done 30 of them. Seems like, no. Probably only done like, what, six, eight? Not even? No? Including last class and the examples I did today. DSDT, what is that? Okay, so what you want, so you're ready to start thinking about what you want, what you're given? I'm okay with that. You say I want DSDT? I agree. Everyone agree with that? How? Uh, when do you want it? When X is 12? Okay. What are you given? The speed of the, the guy, right? Seven miles per hour. That, that's X, though. X is his, as he moves, X grows. So you're given DX DT. And it's what? Seven feet per second. I mean, I'm pretty much of, of the uh, opinion that once you have this, what you're given and what you want, and when you want it, once you have that, like, you can start thinking equation. So what am I going to need to try and uh, connect together here? The X and the S from my general picture. Come with me. I'm going to a new page. All right. Let's connect them. Give me any equation you can come up with that connects X and S together. Any any ideas? What do you see here from what I've drawn? What do you what do you see? Geometrically, what is it? Two triangles, right? See two triangles? You see a big one and a small one? Let me draw the big one. The big one looks like this. Twenty. S. Everyone see that one? That is that one right there, right? Smaller triangle looks like this. You see that one? Okay, you'll see those? So what? What what is this? Do you know what this side is? It's it's S minus X. It's whatever this total length is, take away this length. That's critical that you see that. So if this was ten and this was three, this would have to be seven. Right? Ten minus three is seven. So whatever S is, subtract from it X, and you get that side. Okay, I'm, I'm all right with that. But what is it about these two triangles? I mean, not only are there two right triangles, there's something else. They have a property. They're called what triangles? Right triangles, but there's something even more. Special right triangles, yes. They are special. How? What do they have in common? Angles, angles, do you agree that the angle of this triangle, the small one, is the same as the angle of the big triangle? So if I label this angle, have you all seen this before? We do the angle, we put a little line through it to say, oh, that's like the first angle. Have you all seen that before? Right? So if this angle and this angle are the same, and they both have a right angle, then what do you can tell me about this angle and this angle? They have to be the same. 
That means these angles are the same, which means these are similar triangles. Not like similar triangles as in, yeah, they look the same. I mean, that's a, there's a precise property of triangles that when they are similar, you have good things. All similar triangles have properties that we can use to come up with an equation. One of the properties of similar triangles is that the ratios of corresponding sides are equal. The ratio of corresponding sides are equal. What do I mean? I mean that if you take this side, 20, and divide it by 5, that's e that should be equal to this side divided by this side. Or you could have done it this way. You could say, if I take this side and divide it by this side, that should be equal to this side divided by this side. The ratio of corresponding sides are equal, congruent, equivalent. So you can set up, you can set up this ratio however you want. So I'll stick to what I did before. I'll take the 20 divided by s. I know 20 divided by s must be equal to what over what? 6 divided by s minus x. Is that an equation containing both s and x? Yes, that's all you needed. Now, I don't want to take the derivative of that right now because I don't like the fact that my s's are on the bottom, my x's are on the bottom. So I'm going to do kind of like a cross multiplying, right? Multiplying both sides by s minus x. And I'm going to multiply both sides by s at the same time. That's technically what I'm doing. I'm multiplying both sides by the LCD. And what happens? These s's cancel. These s minus x's cancel. And you're left with 20 times s minus x equals 6s. My s looks like a 5. That's the same as if you would have just cross multiplied, right? But the black is technically what we're doing. Now, is that something you're willing to take a derivative of? All right, I, I think I can even clean this up better. 20s minus 20x equals 6s. Wow, okay. 14s equals 20x. That's a pretty clean equation right there. Any questions? You want to take a derivative of that? What's the derivative of the left side? 14 is a constant times derivative of s, ds dt. Right side, 20 is a constant, derivative of x, dx dt. Do you know ds dt? Is that what we wanted? Okay. Do you know dx dt? Yes. What do you notice we don't need here? I mean, there's something very subtle happening. I'm wondering if you're catching it. Did we need to know how far the man away was away from the pole? According to this, in order for us to know the rate at which the shadow is moving relative to the pole, did we need to know the, uh, where the man was, according to that equation right there? No. Which means what? It's constant. Hmm. 
Is that over your head? Are you getting that? Look. Look, in order to know DSDT, how fast the shadow is moving, all I need to know is this, which is how fast the man is moving. It, nowhere in this equation am I required to tell you where the man is, which means where the man is makes no, has, plays no part in determining how fast the shadow is moving at all, which is kind of weird to think when you think about it. What we're saying is if you take this guy, where is his shadow, and you look at this shadow right here, look at the tip of his shadow, that shadow is moving at a constant rate. It does not matter where he is. You would think, maybe you would think that no, the further he goes, the faster it goes, but that's not the case. It's interesting. All right, we are, we're almost done with that one. Uh, what's DXDT here? Seven, right? Seven? Just plug seven in and we're there. Uh, 14 DSDT equals seven times that is 140. Divide both sides by 14. What do we have? 10? 10 what? Feet per second. The shadow is moving at 10 feet per second relative to the pole all the time. That's even stranger. He's moving at 7 feet per second, but his shadow is moving at a constant rate of 10 feet per second. Uh, that's just the way the geometry works out. All right, I think we have time for one more. So what? Yeah, I'll let you pick. The latter one's too easy. We're not going to do the latter one. Do you want the conical cup? No, we're going to do the conical cup. I think it's a better problem. It's a more classic problem. All right, this one doesn't... I, I've only seen this maybe ever done in a class maybe once, and it was me. I don't think it was ever anyone I saw doing it in a classroom. So it's not that it's harder, it's just not one of your just traditional Cal 1 problems. So this one is. No, this is straight out of your book. It's straight out of the book. Okay, so let's do this one. A conical cup. I'm going to try this one again without the picture. A conical cup is four inches tall, six inches wide. Picture time. Conical cup. Here's my moment. Here's my general. I have a conical cup. Do I have a... I don't have a match. How do you draw a conical cup? Well, you, the top of it's like this. Not bad except that it's supposed to be wider than it is tall, but that's okay. It's four inches tall and six inches wide. Is that going to change? No, I mean, it's a cup, right? Cup's not changing. It's what's inside of it's changing, right? Water is being poured into the cup at a constant rate. So things, something's going into it, but the cup itself, the shape of that, it's not going to change. So that means in our general picture, we can do the same thing. Water is being poured in, right? So here's your water going in. And... It's going in at a constant rate, 2 pi cubic inches per second, or a second. So every second, they're putting 2 pi cubic inches into this cup. How fast is the water level rising when the water is 1 inch from the top of the cup? So the moment in time, the water level is 1 inch from the top, isn't it? 
So inside this cup, one inch from the top, at the moment in time, I've got water in there, right? That's, that's water all in there. And I know at that moment in time, this from here to here is, is one inch from the top. Uh, this M is not meters. That's my moment in time, right? That's what I get for being lazy. Moment in time. All right, help me out. What would you like me to put here? Oh. D what? D H D T? Where's your H? Okay, but where is that? I, I agree with you, but I'm 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 asking you because I want you to how fast is the water level rising? Water level rising. So I have my general picture. I have water over here, right? It's moving. So H, you're saying DH, DT, where would H be on this picture? Okay. So where is it? Where's H on in the picture, though? Like the distance from here to the top? Or the distance from the water to the bottom? What do you all think? Bottom? How fast is the water level rising? The water level should be the measurement from here down to here. That would be our H. Now, we are not given H over here directly, right? But we know what it is, don't we? If this is one inch from the top, then how high is the water? Three inches. See, so we are given H indirectly over here. So that would be H. Now, I agree with you. Let's go. Um, you want, you said, DH, DT. When do you want that? When H was what? Careful. When H is 3. You have to come back over here and realize that from here to here, is three because they when they add up they have to be four right so it was tricky the, the one inch from the top was kind of giving you the height of the water sort of go with me okay what's given dvdt is two pi because you're given Water being poured in at a constant rate of 2 pi cubic inches. Cubic inches means volume, doesn't it? A second means per second, so that's a rate. It's the rate at which your volume is changing per second. So it's a dv dt is 2 pi. Questions? I need to connect v to h. V to H. I think it's new page time. This is my general picture. I'm coming back to this general picture. And how is the volume of that related to the height? When I say the volume of that, what am I talking about? The volume of what? The volume of the water, not the cup, the water. How's the volume of the water connected to the height of the water? So there's some formula somewhere for a cone, volume of a cone. The volume of a cone is one-third pi r squared h. So if you look in your notes or whatever, it'll show a picture, your cheat sheet formulas. It'll show you a picture of a cone 
where you're given the height and the radius. If you know the radius of the cone, you know the height of the cone, then the volume of it is one-third pi r squared h. Our cone's flipped over. It's the blue one, right? What's wrong with that formula as it appears right now for us? What's wrong with this? Or why is this not exactly what we want? We don't know anything about r, right? Well, we may know something about r, but we don't know dr dt. And you always have to keep in mind that when you take a derivative implicitly with respect to time, every variable you have here, you're going to get a d, that variable dt, no matter what. So I'm going to get a dv dt, I'm going to get a dr dt, I'm going to get a dh dt. I know nothing about dr dt. So what would you think we might be able to do? Hmm? The diameter what? Okay, so the radius that we're, yes, y'all are all on the right track. The radius that we're talking about is this radius right here, aren't we? That's the radius we're talking about right there. The problem is this radius is not fixed, right? It's not fixed because the water level is changing. But it must maintain a certain proportion because it's within this cup, yes? So somehow we're going to be able to get that R and hopefully we'll be able to remove the R from this equation and just have a V and an H in there. So here's our, here's our standard approach to this. We imagine we come in here with a, like a knife and just cut this cone right in half and look at a cross section, a flat cross section of this picture. If we do that, so imagine coming in here with your knife, cutting it straight down the middle this way. And when we do that, Open it up and take a look. You'll have a big red triangle like this. God, terrible. And then the water level in there would look like this. Right? That's what it would look like in a cross section. If I drop a vertical right down the middle and do this, do you see what I've just created there? Ignore, ignore this right here. Just look at that right side. Isn't that similar triangles again? And so tell me about tell me about this distance right here. Do you know this distance? Three, because it's that's part of the cone, right? This distance right here is R. We knew that. The distance all the way was what? Four. And the distance from here to here was was you can't fix time yet. You can't fix it. It's, it's H, right? It's H. Everything's got to maintain what's a variable is a variable until we take the derivative. After that, you can fix everything. So it might be worth it for you to draw the two triangles side by side. You have that one, and you have this one. And we, you said they were similar. We agree with this, that those angles are all the same, right? The angle on the bottom is the same for both, which means this top right angle is the same for both. You told me that this side was 3, and you told me this side was 4. You told me this side was R, and this side was H. And so because they're similar, I can set up a ratio, can't I? Any ratio I want. What, would, what ratio would you like me to write down? Go ahead, anyone, I don't care. Do what? Okay, 3 over 4 equals R over H. Those have to correspond, though. You have to do, you know, the small side over the big side, the small side over the big side. So R over H. <clears throat> that is an equation that contains R and H. 
And now what I'll do is I will cross multiply 3H equals 4R. Questions? Now, am I differentiating that? No, why did I do all this? Yeah, because I was trying to rewrite the formula. I already had the formula that connected volume and height, but it had the R in there. I didn't like the R. I wanted the R to be gone. This right here tells me that I can replace R with what? Well, I should take that 4 back to the other side. R can be replaced with what? 3 fourths H. So I'm going to be able to go back up to that volume formula, replace R with 3 fourths H, <clears throat> and I'm in business. So I'll do it right here. Volume equals 1 third pi, but what's R? 3 fourths H pi R squared times H. There's my new volume formula. <clears throat> so volume is one third pi. I'm cleaning up, I'm not taking a derivative. What's uh, three fourths squared? Nine sixteenths. What's H squared? H squared, and then you still have time it times H out there. I think there's still some cleaning we can do. Volume is 3 here. So 3 sixteenths pi H cubed. There it is. That's what I'll be differentiating. Volume is 3 sixteenths pi h cubed. Oh, I have two minutes. DVDT is 3 sixteenths pi derivative of h cubed 3h squared times dh dt. There's my derivative. Do you know dvdt? Do you know h at the moment in question? Yes. dh dt? That's what we want, right? No, that, yeah, that's what we want. We have everything. I'll leave it to you to finish that up on your own. Okay, as far as homework is concerned, may I? <clears throat> Where'd you get this book? The printing in it's all weird. Yeah. All right, so here's what I'd like for you to look at for homework. This is uh, from 2.7, so this is on page 133. I think if that this book is legit. Um, numbers 13. Sixteen. This one's tough. Seventeen. Eighteen. Twenty. Twenty. 
27. Thirty one. Thank you. Depending on you, that could potentially be several hours of work right there. Yeah. So please <clears throat> get working on that stuff. All right. Come with questions <clears throat> on Thursday, but we will start some new material. I'll probably spend the first forty minutes answering questions, which means I could probably do two of them, right? Have a great day. Hope I didn't ruin it.